So Stephen, perhaps you could start by just explaining in a nutshell what this big book is all about. The, the book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, is uh, uh, documents that violence has been in decline for long stretches of time on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the treatment of children and animals. All of them have been in decline statistically. The particular piece that I uh, adapted for The Guardian was on one aspect of that change, uh, a phenomenon that I call the new peace. The fact, little appreciated, that over the last 20 years, the number of wars and the rates of death in war have fallen all over the globe. And the, the number of deaths in war might be at an all-time low. So reasons to be cheerful, a very unusual <coughs> message. Or at least uh, reasons to be grateful, I say. Grateful, very yes. good. Um, I've been watching the thread where we've been having a discussion about your book over the last couple of days. Um, and I'm going to pick up some of the questions that people have posted. Um, I mean, one of them that, to start with was the definition of violence. A number of commentators have had problems. Is the only form of violence the sort of physical harm to another human being? Are there forms of structural violence? And I think they're speaking in terms of the way in which sort of economic systems can lead to, you know, very, very kind of severe working conditions, for example. Would you recognize any other kinds of violence? No, not for the point of, not, n not for the purpose of this book. You can't write a book about everything that's bad. Uh, and people are tempted to use violence as a metaphor for other things that they deplore or dislike. But as a scientist trying to make sense of what's happened over the course of human history, to lump together everything that's bad in any way whatsoever is not going to give you a coherent picture. So uh, one of the other things that people have found uh, are problematic about the thesis, and they've been discussing it uh, on the thread, is this idea of the way in which you use percentages, proportions of the population, uh, to, to measure out what have been the worst atrocities in human nature, rather than absolute numbers. And when you use that scale, World War I, World War II, millions dead, actually count for very little because it's a smaller proportion of the population. How would you defend that way of measuring it? Well, for one thing, the main development I speak about in the article, the trend over the last 20 years, is a trend both in, both in absolute numbers and in relative numbers. But more generally, it's rates that are the the relevant way of measuring how violent the world is at any given time. Otherwise, the more people there are, the more violent you're going to say the world is, even if the tendency of any person to commit violence has decreased. One way of thinking about it is, if I were to be uh, born as a random person at some point in history, what are the chances that I would be the victim of violence? To answer that question, you have to look at proportions. It just makes no sense to look at absolute numbers. There was one phrase in particular in the book which struck me as, as kind of tricky to get my head around. You talked about the escalator of reason, the way in which we've become more reasonable and more empathetic, and, and the argument is very well made. Um, and you said that this can help us to see the, the futility of violence. Now, it's, it's that word futility that has been troubling me, because violence is a way of achieving certain ends. And I'm not sure whether human nature or, or large, even large chunks of human beings have actually decided that violence is futile. It's just that they've decided that there may be other more effective ways to achieve their ends, but they will resort to violence when it's necessary or when they see fit, as indeed we saw in the Iraq war, for example. So do you really think that there has been a greater understanding of the futility of violence? Yes, I, I think there has. That's why the, the rates of uh, death in war have gone down, that people realize not only that morally is uh, violence uh, a bad thing, whether it's committed in war or in homicide. It used to be that wars were glorious and noble, uh, and people didn't even think of them as just homicides multiplied m manyfold. Uh, but also, when you stand back from history and you see that violence invites retaliation, uh, and that uh, each side is convinced that it is in the right, that its acts of violence are justified retaliation, its opponent's acts of violence are naked aggression. If you step back, you take a psychological stand, uh, stance, you realize everyone's always going to think that. I might be thinking it right now. Uh, we'd both be better off if we figured out some way to, uh, to avoid this in the first place. You describe a decline. Now, is it safe to call it progress? Uh, I mean, you ad acknowledge that it could be reversed. Um, uh, I think a lot of people think, well, maybe we're just going through a period of peace that the violence has gone into sort of abeyance, if you like. You know, can we really call it progress? 
Uh, well, it's certainly progress in terms of what has happened so far. Whether it will be permanent is another question. There's, it, it may not be. We can have all kinds of nasty surprises. There's an enormous random element to human history, contingencies of individual decision making, uh, phenomena that come out of the blue that no one predicted beforehand. But it is not the case that history is, say, cyclical or that there's a certain urge for war that has to burst out and that the longer you repress it, the more likely it becomes. I have an extensive analysis of the statistics of war over time, which show no build up and release, no cycles, just uh, a big dose of randomness. That, that's interesting, no sort of build up and release, because one of the, one commentator said, surely that the, 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 the new peace, the period since the, sec the end of the Second World War, has been sort of haunted by the atrocities of the First and Second World War, and that has sort of really energized the need to find peace and avoid conflict, that you know, war casts a long shadow and that can actually be very constructive in, in kind of reinforcing peace. Uh, I, I think that the, that the world is very skittish about getting into another big war and has learned some lessons from uh, the uh, massive destruction of World War II. It's an example of recognizing the futility of war and, and trying to prevent it from happen happening again. But that effect doesn't fade over time? Not necessarily. Uh, so for example, Canada and the United States haven't had a shooting war since, eight, since 1812. It's not as if they're, they've forgotten the lessons of 1812 and they're roaring for a rematch. Countries can, when they fall into a state of peace, it, it can last uh, for long stretches of time. Well, I, I looked at your sort of map of where the civilizing process, the decline of violence, is, has still not quite reached, and one obviously looks at places like the Congo or where there's been a long-running civil conflict, um, and it clearly maps onto areas which have not got strong states. Yes. Now, strong states have been a, a major part in the played a major part in the decline of violence. Uh, through the early modern period in, in Europe. Um, but strong states is a deeply, um, deeply problematic issue in many parts of the developing world across Af Africa and Asia, places like Afghanistan or Somalia, where it's very hard to build strong states. So are these lessons that we can really actually learn from to sort of apply? And also, isn't it that some strong states create the vacuums where there are then problems of poor governance? Absolutely. And, and in fact, the uh, what, what we should identify is not strong states, but competent states. Now, competent states have to be minimally strong, but they can't just be strong, because if they simply brutalize their own populations or let violence build up and then start uh, indiscriminately murdering people in a particular village, that can create more violence than it prevents. So it's really competent, uh, moderately democratic, not too corrupt governments that, that uh, we should look, look for. And it's true that they, that doesn't come easily. There are certain factors, though, that do predict whether democracy will take in a given region. And one of them is uh, education, holding everything else constant. A more educated populace is more receptive to democracy uh, several years down the line. Ross Dusat in the New York Times had a very interesting blog that, uh, in which he sort of sees that the, the long period of violence in Europe was a way of thrashing out all kinds of issues and building up a strong state. Uh, and that, this, that, that the, the peace may be the outcome of centuries of conflict, so that there's a kind of process over time which parts of Africa and, and Asia may need to go through, which involves a lot of violence. Would you kind of understand and would you agree with that thesis? Um, it, it, it's hard to say. It's possible. On the other hand, just because something, A happened before B it doesn't mean that A was necessary for B to happen. And it's true that current peace uh, was preceded by a lot of violence. Does that mean you have to have the violence in order to get the peace? Uh, I, I'm not convinced. Thank you very much, Stephen. My pleasure.